Uh, hello everyone, this is Dr. Lahari and uh, welcome back to Radiographic Interpretation Made Easy. Uh, this is case 6. The only difference with this case is that we'll be discussing it, I will be discussing it alone and uh, <coughs> you can give me your feedback about it uh, after you've seen this. So, uh, like any radiographic interpretation, the steps in uh, interpreting a intraoral periapical radiograph would be first of all to analyze uh, the um, radiograph taken, what are the normal anatomical landmarks, uh, if there are any radiographic faults, what type of faults do we see. Then we come down to which are the teeth present and the uh, teeth of interest. <coughs> Next, uh, for each tooth of interest, it's important to again discuss the crown, root, height of alveolar crest, periodontal ligament space, lamina dura, alveolar bone proper, radiographic diagnosis <coughs> and of course add a note on differential diagnosis wherever applicable. Let's look at this radiograph here. <coughs> so first of all we need to analyze uh, that it is an intraoral periapical radiograph and uh, um, from the appearance it looks like it is the second quadrant. So, what are the normal anatomical landmarks seen? Right? So, here we see that there's a yellow line which is your zygomatic arch. Right? Next, we see the purple line which is the floor of maxillary sinus. Next, you see another shadow that's here in uh, the posterior part of this uh, maxillary radiograph which in fact doesn't really belong to the maxilla. It is the coronoid process of the mandible that is visible on uh, most posterior parts of most of the maxillary molar uh, radiographs. Next we move on to identifying the faults. In this particular radiograph I don't really see many faults except for a few scratch marks here. Uh, otherwise it looks uh, good enough. Not many faults. The uh, teeth look uh, in well proportion. <coughs> and the teeth of interest are uh, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6 and 2, 7. Right? So that's 2, 4 for you. That's 2, 5 which is second premolar, first molar and second molar moving on so we have identified that our tooth of interest here is 2 4 and why because we see that there is a nice uh, radial lucency that you're seeing in the crown here right so uh, this radial lucency if you observe closely is actually the is arising from the distal part of the crown and is extending to involve the enamel as well as the dentine Right, so moving on, you will see that it is actually involving the pulp of the tooth. Alright, so you have a, um, this radiolucency most likely looks like dental caries. Okay, the, the radiolucency looks very similar to that of dental caries and uh, which is involving the pulp of the tooth. So that, that's what we have here, a well-defined radiolucency involving enamel, dentine and the pulp, right? So next move on to the roots of the tooth. First premolar is supposed to have two roots. So it's important for us to identify that the outline of the roots, whether they are normal or not. So looking closely, you will see that that is the outline of the first root and the second root. Now in a dental radiograph which is a two-dimensional image it is virtually impossible for you for us to differentiate which is the um, buccal root and which is the lingual root so we, or the palatal root it will be very difficult for us to tell to identify that we would have to do a shift technique. Next uh, is of course uh, you know the first premolar root and we have the molar roots you can even identify that this is the palatal root and this is the mesiobuccal and distobuccal root uh, similar to the second molar as well. Okay moving on to the height of alveolar crest right so generally the height of the alveolar crest is the yellow line that you can see right so in this radiograph you will be surprised that you see two yellow lines why is because there 
there is a considerable amount of radiolucency in comparison to the other side which appears normal right so this gives us an impression of what we call as bone loss now how do we measure the height of alveolar crest this is how you measure it so if this were the CEJ of the crown and if a normal root of a uh, first premolar is about 14 mm around 14 mm then it is important for us to estimate the amount of bone loss that we are seeing right so this amount of bone loss would be roughly around 5 mm of bone loss so in case you have had radiographic faults where you're having foreshortening or elongation obviously this uh, bone loss also the would not be accurate so we would name this as horizontal bone loss up to 5 mm below CEJ. Next is uh, important to identify the periodontal ligament space. Right? So when you're looking at the periodontal ligament space, you will see that you can see a black line all along the tooth which is uh, demarcated by this yellow line here. Right? So in this radiograph you can see that the apex of the tooth you cannot see this yellow line anymore right so this is the area where you are having widened periapical uh, uh, periodontal ligament space as well as a loss in the lamina dura in this area so lamina dura is the white line and periodontal ligament space is the black space between the white line and the uh, cementum of the tooth or the tooth root Right, so if you look closer, these are the normal trabecular uh, appearances seen at pattern of trabeculae at the uh, maxillary premolar uh, apex region. And hence, in this radiograph, the alveolar bone proper appears relatively normal. Moving on, since we have seen that there is widening of PDL space, there is loss of lamina dura at the apex and there is a very well defined radiolucency which is dental caries involving the pulp, they all correlate and your radiographic diagnosis is now deep carry 24 which is tooth number, always better to start with the tooth number, tooth number deep dental caries with chronic periapical um, periodontitis tooth number finding followed by the diagnosis